Well, this week has been really weird. It's a tale of destruction, reconfiguration and head-scratching updates around Starbase. Outside that, a bunch of missions and events. Some going to plan, but not so for others. One thing's for sure, there never seems to be a boring week of space news in 2023. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Displate. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and today some pretty neat updates that we've got for you for the future of Starbase and the test sites at Boca Chica, Texas. First, let's kick off though with the exciting and somewhat unexpected surprises at the launch site. Remember last week when we talked about the servicing of the booster a quick disconnect? Well, things are tracking along quite nicely, and this week SpaceX performed open and closed tests. That was looking nice and clean, and next up we will most likely be seeing the reinstallation of the huge flex hoses, followed by the hood to close it all up nicely. With the assessments and any repairs done here, I'm really hoping that they won't have to go through such an extensive refurbishment campaign of these systems again with future launches. After each major event, they can simply strengthen what is needed and then implement further protections to just beef it all up. Speaking of refurbishments, looking upwards towards the Ship Quick Disconnect or the Ship QD, it was obvious that right after the flight test that was needing a little bit of TLC. This week the gigantic SpaceX crane lumbered over towards the orbital pad, hooking up to the Ship QD and it lifted off and free from the broken actuators. The crew then set to work removing those actuators, and amazingly the ship quick disconnect was actually being repaired in place without being entirely removed. Only a few hours later the crane detached, and there we had it. You could actually clearly see the ship QD was sitting nice and level once again, all ready to connect up to ship 28 when it is eventually time for it to be stacked for the first time on top of booster 10, obviously after some static fire action. So moving over to the suborbital side, this is where I think we are going to see a huge shakeup. The newly branded gateway to Mars in this area is going to transform quite a lot perhaps. Why do I say that? Well, say goodbye to suborbital pad A. Early in the week, the SpaceX crews ripped into it. There goes the ship propellant interface there being toppled over as they began to rapidly remove it from existence. From an activity point of view, this pad has been really quiet for months. The last time that we saw it being used by a vehicle was all the way back in February actually. That was where Ship 26 performed two cryogenic loading tests. Since then, the stand structure hasn't really been touched at all. I think given how close Pad A is to the new launch site entrance being constructed, I wouldn't be surprised if this is all to give way to a new structure or a redesign of the entire area. And just like that, we only had one remaining suborbital pad with the last main part of Pad A being pushed over. I will say, it hasn't been a quiet week for its neighbour, suborbital pad B, either. The launch site's pad clear alarm shouted out warnings to those in the vicinity that a loud venting from the suborbital pad B quick disconnect will occur. Interestingly, they were conducting blowdowns over the next hour, advising that hearing protection was recommended. Yes, it is nice to see that they are still keeping pad B in good shape. A pretty good reason that they chose to do that pipe clearing now is that Ship 28 was expected to come to the suborbital stand very soon. Before that was possible, SpaceX attended to some very important issues. Yes, in a never seen before spectacle, SpaceX invited Santa himself, together with a healthy batch of Christmas decorations to come along for the ride on the rollout of Ship 28. To make room, they first had to move Ship 30 out of the high bay due to it blocking the exit. The decorated transporters moved in, and with the Christmas tree going up, the move of Ship 28 out of the high bay was near. Before it could actually move down the highway, the counterweights on the side of the vehicle needed to be installed for balance, and obviously some more decorations with them. Good on the SpaceX crew having a bit of fun with this, that isn't something that you normally see, and the spectacle as they rolled all the way to the launch site had everyone talking. They didn't spare the decorations of the launch site either. Christmas cheer installed on the outer ring of the orbital launch mount, the staircase and the huge integration tower. Before we knew it, the ship was turned into the main entrance of the launch site and straight there towards suborbital pad B. They hooked up the lifting jig to it, the temporary pressurization plate was removed, and up it rose onto the pad. The quick disconnect there hooked up, and with the ship now pressurized by the ground systems, the SpaceX crane could let go. It is exciting times again, my friends. Bring on that testing campaign.
Now back at the build site, Ship 30 was still out of the high bay. Before it could be moved in, some rearranging needed to happen. Ship 29 was moved out of the back right corner, and in Ship 30 went to take the place of 29. Now you might notice that Ship 29 is suddenly lacking a lot of the tiles at the locations where they are usually glued on. I suspect they've been testing these tiles just like they were with Ship 28 a while ago to see if they had adhered correctly or not. This ship was then moved in to take the place of Ship 28, now obviously on Test Stand B. Now, if you remember from last week's update video, our beloved Starship there with no flaps or thermal tiles had been moved over closer to the ship engine installation stand and was hooked up to the load spreader on the crane. After that, we speculated that Ship 26 could be having its Raptor engines removed, followed by potentially being scrapped, but actually that doesn't seem to be the case right now. Only three days later, Ship 26 was moved back over to the holding spot in the rocket garden, so it seems the crane was only really there to support the structure while SpaceX crews worked on the internals of the ship. What's actually going on here then? I do still think that Ship 26 will eventually be scrapped, but it's a bit of a mystery at this point. Maybe this work was done just as a preparation step for dismantling it, but yes, what do you think? It's also been a little while since we've talked about Mega Bay number 2, but here's an interesting update for you. Batches of windows have been lifted up over the past few weeks and slowly but surely moved into place. Now, they may look a little small up there, but these are big windows. Just compare it to the workers installing them. It does take quite a while to ensure that these are placed correctly, so they've likely chosen to get these completely installed between the last integrated flight test and the next. You certainly want everything complete and secure before the next big flight. It was especially noticeable how much the windows at Mission Control were shaking when Booster 7 was rocketed off the pad, and that building is much further away. You could just imagine if some of those much larger windows came loose. Close by, the Star Factory keeps on growing. However, unlike what we've seen before, these new major beams for the next section right next to Highway 4 are of a very different design. Unlike the previous single I-beam style, these vertical supports are made up of two 90-degree offset I-beams with diagonal supports going back and forth. Given that they have been painted dark grey, perhaps this is where that awesome glass siding will go after all, just like we saw with the renders. The images by RGV Aerial Photography are just gorgeous here, aren't they? Add to that the beautiful views from Randolph Visuals, aka the incredible Chief out there, and we've got you covered. You may not realise this, but Chief out there has got a Patreon now and releases galleries of material a bunch of times each week, so if you can, consider signing up there to help support him. That goes a long, long way, and thanks for subscribing and supporting what all of us do, in fact. So grateful that we've got this amazing community helping us all to do what we collectively do here. Now, they're looks to have been a change in the typical process we see for booster testing. Boosters are stacked together in the mega bay once the individual sections have been made. Once the booster is stacked in the bay, it gets finishing touches such as the grid fins and additional pipework is installed. At this point, the whole vehicle is rolled out to masses without its engines to perform a cryogenic proofing test. Now, there's a reason that I'm telling you this. That test, of course, usually verifies the structure is stable, and the booster then comes back for engine installation, and then moves on to its static fire testing campaign. But what is intriguing is that this doesn't seem to be the case right now for Booster 12. It has not conducted any cryogenic proofing tests at all, so its rollout to masses was expected to be the next thing that we would see. Well, it seems that space is skipping that step entirely for Booster 12, because here it was being lifted onto the engine installation stand without even being tested once. So why has this decision been made to skip that test? At first, I thought that they perhaps believed the design of the Super Heavy is strong enough that they don't need those tests anymore. But then, even new Falcon 9 boosters still conduct cryogenic tests to verify their tank structure before static fires at McGregor. As far as we know, they do perform those tests with all nine engines installed, which would obviously save time. What we're actually wondering now is if this will be the case for Booster 12, a structural test with all 33 Raptor engines installed. After all, if they are super confident with the structure, this would cut down on the process a lot. Just think of the huge planned operations it takes to move any of these monster vehicles. The self-propelled modular transporters need to move slowly to avoid tipping over the vehicle. That makes for a long rollout and closure time between the production site and masses, some of which have lasted over three hours. To avoid that back and forth disruption between all three sites, installing the engines on new boosters from the start and then moving them to the launch site straight away would save a lot of interruption. They can then do both the cryogenic loading tests as well as kick off the static fire campaign.
Now, we've got some pretty amazing stuff to talk about at Massey's too. More on that in just a moment, but first, you've just got to check this out. Yes, these are from Displate sponsoring this video. Game-changing metal posters that will refresh your wall space in just seconds. No tools needed, no holes in walls. I installed these in absolutely no time. Just clean the area, pop on the base sticker, and then the magnet sticks right on top of that. With that magnetic mounting system ready to go, you just pop your amazing disc plates on, and job done. Now, obviously, I selected some space-related ones. The Planet Mars poster with its moons, the Pillars of Creation by the James Webb Space Telescope, and of course, I'm a huge Star Trek Next Generation fan, so the Enterprise D blueprint there in all its glory. So easy, and you can see why Displate is a great alternative to paper posters or canvas prints. Hey, we're all different though, right? And the available designs and collections that you can get will align with your interests or your family's. There is so much to choose from here, whether it be movies, gaming, comics, nature, and loads more. These are manufactured in Europe, and they do everything that they can to get them to you within four to five days. The great thing is, you can pick these up even cheaper than usual with this special Christmas promotion on all designs by just going to my link, displate.com slash Marcus House, or using the discount code Marcus House. You get 22% off for one or two displays, or 33% off if you pick up three or more. Thank you, Displate. So yes, activity around Massey's is getting really crazy. In an event on Tuesday, Kathy Leaders, SpaceX's Starbase General Manager, indicated that Massey's will be a site for engine testing. It isn't clear yet if that just means general Raptor engine testing or full-on vehicle static fires. The test site is rapidly being reconfigured, with subchillers now properly installed at two locations, one of these to cool down the liquid oxygen and the other for the liquid methane. Now, next to that second set, a new intriguing pad has popped up with what looks to be anchored bolts for two circular tanks. Where could those tanks be coming from, though? Well, as we were preparing this video to go live, NASA Spaceflight caught two large tanks heading down to the dock to be loaded onto a barge. Along with that, another Starship tower section. We are assuming that all of this is going to Starbase, so it really does look like that long-awaited second tower will begin to take shape very soon at the Gateway to Mars. There also looks to be a very interesting story behind those two tanks as well, so stay tuned for all that to come. Finally, at Massey's, the Booster 7.1 test tank here was also being scrapped this week after being at the location since way back in September of 2022. So yes, Falcon Heavy action this week, right? It was supposed to take off on Tuesday after having been already delayed from Sunday due to poor weather. A scrub then followed on Monday, about half an hour before liftoff, due to a ground side issue. How about Tuesday? Nope, in fact, by Wednesday, it was laid down entirely to be rolled back into the SpaceX hangar. Nice shot there by Greg Scott. Hopefully we'll get to see this fly soon. It sure has been one of those weeks, really. Along with other scrubs, the Starlink Group 634 mission was pushed back due to weather. And likewise, last I looked, the Starlink Group 79 mission had been pushed back as well. Around the same time that we were learning that, though, we were also learning that SpaceX had funding taken back off the table. The Federal Communications Commission had made the final decision denying the Starlink application for $885 million in public funds to expand the network to various areas of rural America. The reason stated is that SpaceX and Starlink failed to demonstrate that it could deliver the promised service. Now, the question, of course, is going to be whether that funding is now reallocated to some other less appropriate provider. Elon posted soon after that Starlink is really the only viable option that could really solve these issues, with the technology essentially being yeeted into orbit multiple times almost every week. In total now, more than 5,200 satellites are providing worldwide service. There really isn't any other option that even comes close to this capability, not to mention the glorious spectacle of those landings. So the thought here is that if the funding is allocated to another competitor, it would essentially be a waste. Elon therefore voiced the opinion that the government should arguably dissolve the program and return the funds to taxpayers rather than it be handed out to other less capable options. I think part of this decision from the FCC comes from slower progress than SpaceX may have liked. They did of course want the full-scale Starlink version 2 satellites being launched by Starship at this point, which has obviously been slower than we would all like. It has not been without its challenges. From the FCC point of view, although they could still see merit to the technology, it was no longer as certain in their eyes, and it was suggested that a future funding round could still occur. 
I mean, SpaceX doesn't really require this funding anyway, of course. They are building it out rapidly regardless. Speaking of which, the next mission is actually the interesting one from Vandenberg in California with Starlink Group 79. You may recall SpaceX adding the Direct to Sell page on their website a few months ago to tease this new service that will be tested in 2024. SpaceX just recently received authorization allowing them to launch modified satellites into three Gen 2 orbits. The Group 79 mission is in fact the first to have the needed communication hardware on board. Yep, the first six Starlink satellites with direct-to-sell capabilities will begin to provide the world with seamless global access to texting, calling, and browsing. I guess this sort of thing will be a thing of the past. What is that? Hey! Anybody? There is no other company launching it anywhere near this volume. Saying that, the recent news about Amazon is quite interesting given that they have now signed a contract with SpaceX to begin launches. That's kind of weird, right? After launching just two satellites on an Atlas V, Amazon must have given in to cost pressure, I suspect, because they've booked in some launches with Falcon 9 there. Currently, there's only three Kuiper satellite missions scheduled in around the middle of 2025 with SpaceX. Not a lot of launches considering that Amazon has already signed up 77 with United Launch Alliance, Ariane Space, and Blue Origin. But with the progress on all those new vehicles, who knows how long it will be to start moving through that queue. SpaceX can't really be avoided in that regard, you just can't beat them. You probably also spotted this recent news that they have just acquired Pioneer Aerospace who make components for Crew Dragon's parachutes. They don't want any interruptions in their supply chain, so they paid $2.2 million to rescue the company from bankruptcy. It's also great to see Rocket Lab back in action. Finally, there we were, those familiar scenes of Electron firing off the launch pad for the first time since mid-September when an unfortunate anomaly caused a mission failure. That was a real bummer considering that Rocket Lab's reliability was looking so great for the past two years or so. Everything in that mission seemed fine, in fact, just up until stage separation. Thanks to the clear anomaly review performed by Rocket Lab, we now know that an arc was produced inside the power supply system of the second stage due to a rare interaction of multiple conditions. That arc created a short on the battery pack powering the second stage and the entire thing lost all its power. Rocket Lab since have made sure that they've fixed this issue to stop it happening again. In this mission though, yes, that is how the Electron second stage is supposed to work. Inside the fairings this time is the QPS SAR satellite built by the Japanese company Institute for IQPS, just part of the Earth observation constellation that will hopefully end up consisting of 36 such satellites. Stoke Space and Relativity Space have just shared some new stuff. If you remember just a couple of months ago, Stoke Space performed this crucial hop test of their second stage prototype, which used its unique aerospike inspired design to perform the hop and land. It's pretty cool. It's got 30 of these little thrust chambers arranged around its circumference. Now, earlier this week, this appeared. It's a part of their first stage tank, looking like it's coming along very nicely already. You can also see a second stage here out of focus in the foreground. The first stage is a more traditional style rocket compared to the second stage. It is powered by seven of these engines, which uses a combination of natural gas and oxygen as the propellants. They even took it for a ride to their Moses Lake test site to put it through its paces. It must have been the week for new hardware to be showing up because Relativity Space was added as well. This is their first Aeon-R engine to fire up beautifully at NASA's Stennis Space Center. This one engine is designed to be 25% more powerful than all the Aeon 1 engines that powered the Terran 1. Yes, 11 times the thrust of the engine there on the left with human for scale. The engine here burned for a total of 10 seconds at about 70% power before shutting down. The next tests will push longer and harder, hopefully coming soon. 13 of these engines will power the huge Terran R first stage. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look like Vulcan Centaur's first mission is going to fly on December the 24th, so I guess Christmas isn't cancelled after all, kids. It seems that ULA wanted to do a little more testing. This week, Vulcan Centaur was rolled out to the vertical integration facility to the launch pad for a full launch day wet dress rehearsal. This test was with the first stage and the Centaur 5 upper stage installed on top of the booster just last month. At this stage, the primary payload, Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander, and the fairings are yet to be installed. Now, sadly, we don't get to see a live stream or even a video from ULA of this wet dress rehearsal, so how did it actually go? Well, two days later, Tori posted that they ran into a few routine issues with 
the ground systems during the rehearsal, and that the previously thought Christmas Eve launch was likely off. It turns out that they wanted to do another full launch day wet dress rehearsal just to double check that everything is fine for launch. Impressively, they managed to fix all the problems and get Vulcan ready for this test. Apparently that went great, and the Vulcan rocket is now on track to fly. So with all this extra testing, that has really set the mission back, and the Peregrine Lunar Lander's launch window between the 24th and 26th of December really has been missed. The next available window to kick off the Lunar Lander mission will be on the 8th of January in the new year. It also looks like Blue Origin's New Shepard is launching again for the first time since September of 22 when the booster engine blew itself up, destroying that section of the vehicle on an uncrewed flight. The Federal Aviation Administration wrapped up that investigation earlier this year, requiring Blue Origin to improve the structural performance before the next attempt. Well, it seems like that is now coming on December the 18th with the NS-24 mission. Again, it's an uncrewed mission, and it'll be shooting 33 science and research payloads into its typical suborbital trajectory. I guess the big question in my mind is when are they going to be happy to have crew back on this? So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd love to keep up to date with all the highlights of space updates each week, please do consider subscribing. If you would like to chat with us more directly, join us here as a patron, a YouTube member, or an ex-subscriber, and get videos earlier and ad-free. So grateful to each and everybody making it to the end here. If you've got a moment, check out this video right here if you missed it. Also, a great help. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.